Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you like, you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate. Both of those links are also in my show notes. And I want to say thank you to Simon Peck who donated to the podcast this week. If you donate or become a patron, I'll make sure I thank you on the air and throughout my social media, as well as at the end of every episode. Don't forget, I have several other podcasts out there, from John to Justin, Pucks and Cups, Canada's Great War, and Coast to Coast, available on all podcast platforms. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter, my handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram and TikTok, where I put up daily videos about Canada's history, and my username is Bairdo37. You can also find weekly videos about Canada's history on my YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com slash c slash Canadian History X. And you can find every transcript of every single episode I've ever done on my website. Just go to CanadaEHX.com. It was in the mountains of British Columbia when soldiers who were going off to serve their country would meet their end in one of the worst train disasters in Canadian history. At Canoe River, just outside of Vilmont, B.C. on November 21, 1950, two trains would meet their destiny, many lives would be lost, and Canada's political future would take a new course. It was on that day when passenger Extra 3538 West, consisting of a locomotive and 17 cars, was moving westbound carrying the Royal Canadian Horse Artillery, consisting of 23 officers and 315 men. On their way for deployment in the Korean War in a movement called Operation Sawhorse, the train had just entered the Rocky Mountains and was heading towards the coast. Half of the cars the locomotive was pulling were made of wood. At the time, regular passengers were no longer carried in wooden cars, only soldiers were. This change was made after the 1947 rail disaster when the Board of Transport Commissioners ruled that wooden passenger cars could no longer be between all steel cars. On this train, though, since the wooden cars had steel underframes, they did not count as wooden cars. At the same time, the Continental Limited was moving eastbound with a locomotive and 11 steel cars going from Vancouver to Montreal. As the trains moved through the mountains, Canadian National Railway dispatcher A.E. Tisdale sent a message from his office in Kamloops to John Jack Atherton, the operator at Red Pass Junction. The order that Tisdale intended to send was, quote, Passenger Extra 3538 West, meet number 2 engine 6004 at Cedarside on number 4 engine 6057 Gosnell, end quote. For whatever reason, the words at Cedarside was not copied down by Atherton and may have not been heard by him, but more on that later. If the Cedarside order had been heard, then the troop train would have gone to the siding at Cedarside to await the passing of the passenger train. The westbound troop train stopped at Red Pass Junction and Atherton relayed the incorrect order to the conductor. The full order had been passed to the Continental. The crew of the Continental expected to meet the troop train 69 kilometers east of Blue River, while the troop train expected to meet the Continental 40 kilometers west of Cedarside. Neither of the train crews knew that they were going to approach each other at an embankment. Both trains were moving at a moderate speed as they were navigating the sharp turn coming into that embankment. Nearby, Thomas Tyndall, a forestry employee, saw the trains approaching each other. He attempted to signal the Continental crew, but they believed his waving was friendly and not frantic, and simply waved back. At 10.35 a.m., the two trains collided one kilometer south of a small station called Canoe River, eight kilometers west of Cedarside. The collision would occur along the only section of Canadian National Railway in the mountains that did not have automated block signals. As the two trains collided, the leading cars of both trains derailed. One coach was shot into the air by the collision and came crashing down on top of the coach behind it. The wooden cars of the troop train were demolished by the steel cars, but most of the deaths would not be caused by crushing, but by the rupturing of steam boilers that penetrated scalding steam and water into the troop cars. Two soldiers, William Barton and Roger Bow, were at the newsstand on the train buying cigarettes. Both men would be shielded by the structure of the newsstand, saving their lives. Two others, Joseph Thistle and James White, were standing nearby and were killed. As soon as the crash was reported, people from Valmont came out to help. At the crash site, the troop cars were smashed completely and rescuers had to break into them with axes to rescue those inside. 
Hampering efforts was the fact that there were no medical supplies on the troop train and the medical officer was not on the train. First aid boxes were empty and the box labeled medical stores only had condoms in it. Thankfully, Dr. P.S. Kemet was on board the other train and he quickly took over dealing with the injured, assisted by his wife who was a nurse. Kemet helped 50 people without any supplies or train personnel. Many of the men were severely injured. One man had nearly every bit of skin on his body burned, while another had a piece of glass sticking in through his chest and out his back. James Henderson, who was on the troop train, would stay, quote, I talked with one soldier who lay shivering in a bunk in the hospital coach. He had no visible sign of injury, but his face was a ghastly green shade. He wanted more blankets and a cigarette, and I gave him both. An hour later, I helped move his body to the other coach, end quote. Telephone lines along the track were also destroyed in the collision, and the weather was minus 18 degrees Celsius, and there was 15 centimeters of snow on the ground, making it difficult to help people without the coal becoming an added problem. A relief call was eventually put into Jasper, but the train took three hours to arrive. A hospital train arrived with two doctors and eight nurses, and one doctor would say upon arrival, quote, There is hardly a case with only one type of trauma, end quote. A rescue train also arrived to take the injured to Edmonton from the scene. The Jasper doctors went with the rescue train, leaving Dr. Komet in charge, and he remained until the army arrived to relieve him and other civilians, and he would go on his way to Edmonton. Emergency beds were also prepared in Kamloops, and a train left with more medical supplies and personnel to aid helping the wounded. Major Francis Leask would say of the work of Dr. Komet, quote, We couldn't have gotten along without him, end quote. In the crash, 61 people were injured and 21 were killed. The weather did not help with finding the dead either, and to this day, four bodies were never found. An explosion and a fire on November 22nd, when work was being done to clear the track, likely consumed the remaining bodies. Lieutenant Paul Cullen would state after the arrival in Edmonton, quote, The experience was horrible. Injured soldiers were lying all over, pinned here and there. Steam seemed to fill everything. At first we couldn't see. The first job was to help those away who were free in the wreckage. Then everything seemed to become organized and the big job of freeing everyone still living went on smoothly. End quote. One man who was on the civilian train described the accident stating, quote, We all climbed out of the diner car and ran towards the front of the train. The engines were both all tangled up together and there were big clouds of steam over everything at the front of the trains. The baggage, mail and express cars were all off the track. End quote. Corporal DJ Johnston would say, quote, We did what we could, that's all. It was pretty rough on a lot of the boys. They stood up well. They did a wonderful job. End quote. Major K.T. White would say, quote, Everybody on the train was absolutely marvelous. There was no panic. End quote. One soldier would state of seeing the soldiers in pain, quote, I was never near the men who were killed, and really it was worse than going into any sort of battle. In this case, nobody had a chance. Nobody knew what was coming. End quote. Private J.W. Campbell was standing in front of a mirror shaving when the train crash occurred. He would say, quote, my face was lathered and I was just reaching for the razor when we hit. My head struck the mirror and my stomach hit the sink. It knocked the wind out of me. I thought we had just gone off the track. I wasn't hurt too much. End quote. Lieutenant A. Doucette had been in the third car but went to the fourth car before the wreck happened, likely saving his life. He would say, quote, I had gone back to get some books for the boys after breakfast and was returning with my arms loaded. While I was passing through the fourth car, we hit. I was thrown the full length of the car, bashed up a bit, but not seriously hurt. End quote. Glenda Cornforth was 14 when her dad died in the crash. She would say, quote, The wreck was such a mangled mess they didn't find my dad's body until spring. End quote. The family of the dead would receive a small settlement. Cornforth's mother received $50 per month, about $1,000 today, while 50 cents a day was provided for Cornforth, amounting to about $5.50 today. Only a few days after the disaster, an inquiry began to find what had happened. The British Columbia Provincial Police and the RCMP investigated, but the crash site was under the jurisdiction of the RCMP. The Canadian National Railway suspended all train men involved, and an inquiry began in Kamloops. Atherton was also fired by the CNR before the hearings, which would begin in Edmonton in December 1950. At the hearings, Atherton testified there was a gap in the transmission, and he did not hear at Cedarside in the transmission. He was supposed to ask for a repeat of the order, but he did not, and he went back to his other duties. He also denied repeating the order back to Tisdale with the two words included. Tisdale would testify that the order was read back to him by both operators with at Cedarside included in both transmissions. He would also testify that there were sometimes gaps in communications because of objects falling against communication lines. Parsons would also testify that Atherton had repeated the order back correctly. 
If you like weird and strange history, then I have the podcast for you. My name is Brenda, and I'm the host of Horrifying History. Are you into the dark side of history? Horrifying History tells you about the side of history that people don't normally talk about. We talk about the tales of haunted places, infamous true crimes, cursed items, and unsolved mysteries, and then we look into the science and documentation to see where does the truth actually lie. Want to get spooky with us? Get your horrifying history fix by subscribing to Horrifying History, which you can find on any major podcast provider. On January 18, 1951, a report was issued by the Board of Transport Commissioners. It did not assign individual responsibility for the deaths, and it called for the CNR to install block signals at the section of line. As for Atherton, his struggle was just beginning. His father had anticipated that charges would be brought against his son over the crash. Atherton's parents lived in Saskatchewan, and their member of parliament for the riding was a man by the name of John Diefenbaker. In December 1950, Atherton's father contacted Diefenbaker and asked that he serve as defense counsel for his son. Diefenbaker, who at the time was 10 years into his 39-year parliamentary career, declined, saying that parliament came first and his wife Edna was very sick. Another issue was that he was not a lawyer in British Columbia, and he would have to pass the bar there. It would have likely ended there with Diefenbaker, but Atherton's father was a very driven man. He knew that Edna Diefenbaker was a powerful influence on her husband, and he would sneak into her Saskatoon hospital room to speak with her. At the time, Diefenbaker was in Australia attending a Commonwealth parliamentary meeting. Later, Diefenbaker came to see his wife, and she told him that Jack Atherton had come to see her about her son's case. She would say, quote, Everyone in the CNR is running away from responsibility for what appears to have been a grievous disregard for human lives. End quote. Diefenbaker told her that the British Columbia bar was notoriously difficult to pass and the fee was $1,500. Edna then told her husband she already told the Athertons that he would take the case. With that, Diefenbaker took the case. Sadly, one month later on February 7th, Edna would die from leukemia, never seeing the case she pushed her husband towards or the huge impact it would have on his later career. On January 9, 1951, Atherton was arrested for manslaughter. Bail was set at $5,000. He was released on bail on January 24th after Alex Moffat, a man from Prince George, and William Reynolds, a CNR employee, each posted $2,500 for his release. After dealing with the death of his wife, Diefenbaker went to British Columbia to take the bar examination. Diefenbaker only had one chance to pass the bar. If he failed, he could not take the case. He paid the fee and was given an oral examination. According to Diefenbaker, the oral examination consisted of the following quote. Are there contracts required by statute to be in writing? End quote. Diefenbaker replied yes. The examiner then asked him to name one of them, and he stated one was a land contract. With that, he passed his test and was congratulated for being the first person to ever get a perfect score. The Calgary Herald would report, quote, We note with pleasure that John Diefenbaker, who is not only one of the most distinguished members of Parliament, but also a first-class criminal lawyer, has accepted to defend John Atherton, the young CNR telegraph operator charged with manslaughter as a result of the Canoe River train wreck. It is a good thing to see the eminent men are still willing to come to the defense of the humble. End quote. On March 13, 1951, the preliminary hearing began, lasting until March 15th. The Crown would call 20 witnesses, while Diefenbaker would argue that the rules put forward by the Canadian National Railway did not require the repeating of the message. He put forward a motion to dismiss, but this was unsuccessful and the trial would go before the Supreme Court of British Columbia. Diefenbaker would focus his argument in the preliminary hearing on block signals. At one point, while examining J.A. Leslie, the assistant engineer of the CNR's Kamloops division, he would say, quote, Is it not true that where block signals are installed, safety is increased by 200%? End quote. Leslie would agree that it was true. Diefenbaker then said, quote, Would block signals have probably averted this accident? End quote. Leslie again said this was true. He would also ask Leslie about the car, stating, quote, Isn't it a fact that all the poor soldiers were in wooden cars? End quote. Leslie would respond, quote, The cars have steel frames and are sheeted with steel. End quote. He would refer to the cars as tourist cars. On May 9, 1951, Colonel Eric Pepler led the prosecution while Diefenbaker defended Atherton. On the first day of the trial, the Crown called several witnesses in the morning while Diefenbaker sat and listened. In Parliament, Diefenbaker was known for his fiery speeches and strong speaking style. The trial would be no dearth. When he had a CNR official on the stand, he would state, quote, 
I suppose the reason you put these soldiers in wooden cars with steel cars on either end was so that no matter what they might subsequently find in Korea, they'd always be able to say, well, we had it worse than that in Canada. End quote. Pepler objected on the grounds that Diefenbaker made a statement, not a question. Diefenbaker then responded, quote, My lord, it was made clear by the elevation of my voice at the end of the sentence that there was a great big question mark on it. End quote. Atherton was only charged in the manslaughter of the troop-trained firemen, not the soldiers, which Pepler reiterated by stating, quote, I want to make it clear that in this case we are not concerned about the death of a few privates going to Korea. End quote. Diefenbaker always had a friend sit in the gallery and watch the jury. After the comment made by Pepler, he would report that two men, one a veteran of the First World War and another a veteran of the Second World War, had disgusted looks on their faces. For Diefenbaker, this was the perfect opportunity, and he seized it, stating, quote, You're not concerned about the killing of a few privates? Oh, Colonel! End quote. Diefenbaker would then always address Pepler as Colonel for the rest of the trial to remind the jury about his statement. He would say in 1975, quote, During the last three days of the trial, my hearing was not quite right. It did not matter what question the Colonel asked, whether favorable to me or to him. I would say, I didn't quite hear you, Colonel. Every time I said Colonel, the reaction of the jury was not such as would have been judged entirely warm towards the Crown or its case. I colonelled him in and I colonelled him out. End quote. Kenneth Binks was then an articling student in Mr. Diefenbaker's Saskatoon office. Uh, in looking at the bare facts of that case, before it came to trial, uh, all laymen and certainly one anxious law student thought, how is that young man ever going to get off? It was the type of situation that he... Uh, excelled in because uh, he waited, uh, the marvelous lawyer, the trial lawyer that he was, until the Crown made mistake after mistake after mistake. The Crown prosecutor had been a colonel at one time and uh, had been trying to get a point across to the uh, jury that it didn't matter how many people were killed. And of course the chief seized on that uh, the, the colonel says it doesn't matter how many people were killed, and uh, away they went. And I, I don't think uh, the Crown had a chance after that. Stephen Baker would argue to the jury that the silence on the line had been the lost words of at Cedarside, and this was caused by a bird possibly dropping a fish on a snow-covered line. Stephen Baker would add that this was something he knew of from previous occurrences. And Stephen Baker would put the blame on the shoulders of Tisdale, stating that he had not been paying attention to the orders when they were sent back to him. At the end of the trial, with their closing remarks, the two lawyers spoke for five hours. Diefenbaker spoke for three of the five hours. The jury would deliberate for 40 minutes and announce the complete acquittal of Atherton. At the trial, his mother broke down in tears at the acquittal of her son. Diefenbaker represented Atherton at his own expense without ever charging him, but about 50% of his costs were reimbursed through donations. The trial concluded late in the day of May 12, 1950. Jack Atherton. The last day of the trial, naturally, was very emotional for me because <clears throat> during the afternoon, the addresses were made to the jury. The Crown made his one-hour address to the jury. The, uh, the magistrate made his approximately one-hour or so address to the jury. And Mr. Diefenbaker made his unwavering three hours address to the jury. Now you could hear a pin drop in the courtroom. There was that much attention on John Diefenbaker. Upon completion of the addresses to the jury, the jury deliberated for only approximately 40 minutes. They came back and announced their not guilty verdict. Well, Mr. Diefenbaker never did send me a bill or ask me for any remuneration. I would say that John Diefenbaker is the greatest man in Canada. He fought unwavering, as far as I am concerned, for the ordinary man of the street. After the trial, the CNR installed block signals at the site of the accident, and three years later it modernized its entire fleet with 302 new cars. Eventually, the line was rerouted to remove the sharp curve. As for Atherton, he would go on to work the Saskatchewan Transportation Company and move to Saskatoon. Pepler would retire in 1954 and he would pass away on November 16, 1957. 
As for Diefenbaker, the case gave him nationwide recognition, and he would be widely congratulated for his victory. When Diefenbaker returned to Parliament Hill, a string of visitors came to his office to congratulate him on the outcome. With the greater name recognition, he would eventually become the leader of the Progressive Conservatives in 1957, and then Prime Minister of Canada later that year, serving until 1963. During the 1957 election campaign, Atherton traveled to Regina to greet Diefenbaker at a campaign stop. He did this at the cost of missing his own wedding rehearsal. Atherton would say after they took a photo together, quote, That's something to have my picture taken with the next Prime Minister. End quote. In British Columbia, Diefenbaker was greeted by huge crowds who remembered his victory six years previous. In 1975, Diefenbaker would say, quote, Of all my jury trials, probably the one best remembered was the Canoe River case. End quote. Standing in the old Prince Albert courtroom, John Diefenbaker remembered. Yes, it's, it's a place that for many years I appeared in continuously. I was on the defense a great deal, although criminal defense never amounted to more than 5% of my practice. I also acted as a prosecutor, but I was not a good prosecutor because I got convictions. And uh, I forgot, once the trial got underway, uh, that the crown never loses. And uh, in the stress of, of a court, I was inclined to forget that fact. And therefore, my prosecution days did not continue very long. I think of one court in which, without calling a witness, as I scarcely ever called any witness for defense. One court, I had nine defenses in a row, and there were nine acquittals over a period of two weeks. Then I prosecuted two, and they were convicted, and the judge said to the jury, you've been wrong for the last couple of weeks, and you're still wrong. Diefenbaker would pass away in 1979 after 39 years serving in Parliament. Today, a monument to the soldiers who died sits at CFB Shiloh, where a memorial parade is conducted every year. A memorial cairn is also erected near the crash site, and the CNR has also put a monument near the site of the disaster. In 2003, during Remembrance Week, five family members of the soldiers who died in the crash were given memorial crosses, while other family members would get their memorial crosses at a later date. Unfortunately, since the soldiers did not reach Korea, they were not given posthumous Canadian Volunteer Service Medals. I hope you enjoyed that episode and my look at the Canoe River train crash. Next week, we're going to look at Black Immigration to Canada in the early 20th century. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. As well, again, if you want to support the podcast, you can for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash canadaehx. And you can donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking Donate. I'd also like to thank all of my wonderful patrons, and I apologize if I get any names incorrect. Michael Matthews, Joanna Parker, Jeff Dahl, Vobs, Robert Page, Richard D., Colin Johnson, Jeff Hershey, Kyle Murray, Steve Pakin, Matthew Gartho, Lionel Romaine, Dr. Bob Turner, an anonymous patron that I truly do appreciate. Randy Hayden, Doug Campbell, Reg W., Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Shove, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Rawa, Luke S., J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. Information from Canadian Encyclopedia, McLean, CBC, The Rocky Mountain Goat, Wikipedia, Vancouver Province, Ottawa Citizen, Edmonton Journal, Calgary, Alberta, Saskatoon Star Phoenix, Victoria Daily Times, and the Sioux Star. Thanks. See you again next time.